thanks for joining us again for this, the first panel after lunch. I uh, hope you're all well fed. Um, my name is Anuj Desai. I am a lawyer and host of a podcast called The Cannabis Conversation. Um, this panel today, we're going to be talking about your legal rights as a cannabis patient. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce everyone. We have Elisabetta Fienza, who is chair of the Standards Working Group for the Cannabis Industry Council. We have Tom Wesson, who is CEO of British Cannabis um, and Canda. Um, Richard Fitzrobin, who is a trainee lawyer and magistrate. And we have Jason Reed, who is co-exec director of Leap UK. Uh, another great lineup here, and um, it's a really important topic. Um, before we get cracking, would each of you mind just quickly introducing yourself and tell us a bit about your background and your relationship to cannabis? Sure, sure. Uh, so while I don't have a condition that uh, cannabis uh, is a treatment for, I was born with a rare condition because I have elevated levels of neurotransmitters, including most cannabinoids. Um, my parents lived through the whole diagnosis of your child is going to die before she's three, um, accessing experimental treatment, selling their house to afford the treatment, going to a different country with me to undertake the treatment, me being really fortunate to have survived it as the only one that did survive it as a child. Uh, then having four strokes at the age of 11 and then discovering uh, that the science had moved forward enough to be able to tell my parents what it was I had and that was that I ha I'm missing enzymes so I can't reabsorb neurotransmitters. They circulate for a very long time. A superpower and also a danger depending on where my levels are. But watching my parents struggle, watching health-induced poverty um, watching what happened when I became an adult and I could not access paediatricians anymore and there were no, you know, adult uh, doctors for adults with my condition because I was the only one in Australia and literally just having to wing it, you know, and I'm, I'll be 60 next year so I've really outlived the prognosis that my parents were given. Um, and as an adult, you know, I learned a lot about my condition as cannabinoid research and endocannabinoid research developed. It gave me more answers than any specialist had ever been able to give me. And so for the last eight years, I've dedicated myself to um, learning as much as I can, advocating for patients, advocating for better standards, uh, better safety in medicines, uh, working with government to try to change their minds uh, about the medicine in both Australia and now in the UK. So it's a real honour to be here and to be able to be you know, at this conference, so thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm now Chair of Standards at the CIC. Great, thank you. <laughs> Tom. Um, yeah, so I'm from British Cannabis, um, started our journey about eight years ago now, um, obviously in the CBD sector, but one of the main things that brought me into the industry um, from the other businesses that I ran was just seeing that typical video online of, of a kid called uh, Jaden in the States that had his life, life transformed by uh, CBD. Um, from that day, I, 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 I that was when British Cannabis was born and we, we built up this company to really change the lives of people like we saw with that little child and, and that journey has been incredible for me, very rewarding. Um, the daily emails that we get, that feedback and just seeing the impact that we can have on people's lives has been the drive that has brought me here today. Um, now obviously we're very positioned within the CBD space but um, now I'm, I'm here today sort of back seeing some of the very old faces again but some very new faces um, and seeing where the market is now and there's been some significant change but there's obviously some more change to come. Um, and I've taken everything that we have learnt in British Cannabis dealing with the users of CBD, understanding their pain points and developing protocols and standards in the CBD sector. Um, and now we bring to you sort of Canda now for the patients and this is really a patient centric uh, app where I want to ensure that we, we know that patients deserve better right now. And we've worked really hard over the last 12 months to develop a solution that addresses those pain points. Um, and it's, but by all means, this is the starting block and we really now want to further develop this and tackle some of the things like what we're talking about today through the use of technology and our expertise and understanding of the industry, the plant and, and various aspects. So um, looking, looking very forward to this talk today. Brilliant. Cheers, Tom. Richard? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, 
as, uh, my name is Richard Fitz Robinson, um, and as far as my background goes, I've been working in the, the legal sector for the last five years. Uh, separately, I've been a, a magistrate on the adult criminal court uh, for the last four years. Uh, so I have some experience in applying the legal framework concerning uh, the misuse of, of drugs. Uh, crucially, I am a former medical cannabis patient also, so I'm uh, really uh, grateful to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for having me and thank you to Max for everything you do, I'm amazing as ever. Um, so I'm Jason Reed, and originally I came from a music and arts background, so my philosophy, as I say numerous times, is always how to get the last seat up and dancing, how do you do that? And this is what I've applied to drug policy. So I have got chronic illness, um, I've had ME pretty much my entire life, along with chronic migraines, which is actually the thing that's most debilitating. So chances are after today with these lights, I'm going to end up with a migraine of some sort. Lucky enough, I'm now a legal medical, medical cannabis patient. What I do is I'm the co-executive director of Law Enforcement Action Partnership UK. We're a global organisation with regional branches. I'm also the global comms now of LEAP. And what I've done historically is quite broad brushstrokes within this big movement. So I've always believed in publicity uh, and marketing. So you mentioned Jaden. That was from one of the films that I produced called The Culture High. And that clip specifically went majorly viral. It, we had millions and millions of hits off of that. And that was one of the first introductions that we had in this country to what cannabis can do to a child and how it can affect the seizures. And it's really strange to see that when it's in front of your eyes. And that's what I've, to say enjoyed is, is a weird terminology, but I've enjoyed opening people's eyes. And now what I do is, again, publicity. I've got a podcast called Stop and Search, which was connected to Leap. Um, we've won awards, which is always really humbling. It means we get extended audiences. And I don't want to preach to converted. I always want to get new perspectives and new eyes on this and how can we do that? And that's what I try and bring to this table. Brilliant, thank you. And <clears throat> there'll be a broad range of perspectives today, which is great. We're here to talk about legal rights as a patient. So even though uh, medical was legalized in 2018, the awareness of that is still quite low. And worryingly, that extends to the NHS and the police. So we're gonna learn a bit more about what our rights are as patients and um, how we can protect ourselves. Let's begin with the big bad law. Uh, Richard, would you mind just telling us what's, what is the law around possessing medical cannabis and what are some practical things that patients should know? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very loaded question, I suppose. Um, so I, to answer that question, I'm, um, I'm probably going to, it'd probably be more beneficial to explain what the law isn't. Um, but before I do that, if I may, um, I think it'd be helpful to introduce the, the legal framework that governs um, the, the use, misuse of drugs, um, explain the legal definition of cannabis-based medicinal products, uh, and then just finish with some situations where even um, medicinal cannabis patients may find themselves in breach of the law. Uh, taken together, this should provide an illustration of, of what the law is. So as an introduction to the framework, the Misuse of Drugs Act, as you may already know, underpins UK drug policy. Um, it establishes criminal offences for a range of activities, including possession, supply, and production of specified controlled drugs. Uh, it brought the UK into line with global prohibition regime established under the UN Single Convention on Drugs of 1961. The primary objective of the Act is to control the use and distribution of drugs that are deemed dangerous and harmful with the aim of preventing misuse. Since 1986, more than three million criminal records have been issued under the legislative regime, with people sentenced to more than 680,000 years in prison. The Misuse of Drugs Regulation creates exemptions to the offense of possession, supply, production, and administration of controlled drugs. These exemptions are necessary to allow healthcare professionals to treat patients without rendering themselves liable to prosecution. The regulations categorize controlled drugs into five schedules based on their therapeutic usefulness and potential harm when misused. So the schedules are on a sliding scale. Schedule one concerns substances that are considered to have a little or no therapeutic value and as such cannot be lawfully uh, prescribed or possessed. 
At the other end of that scale is Schedule 5, which concerns the counter drugs that can, of course, uh, be legally possessed without prescription. So as we know, in 2018, the laws on cannabis changed, which meant that cannabis-based medical products were moved to Schedule 2. two. Um, and this was followed a review and a recommendation by the chief medical officer who um, made that recommendation. And it means that in certain conditions, um, unlicensed cannabis-based medicinal products can lawfully be prescribed by a specialist doctor possessed and used by a patient in England, Wales, and Scotland. So the legal definition of cannabis-based medicinal products um, well, in the new regulations, there is a, a three-limb requirement to define such products. Um, surmised, Regulation 3 states that a cannabis-based medicinal product for human consumption is a product which um, contains cannabis, a given, um, is, is for medicinal use in humans, and is the ingredient in the medicinal product. Now, it's important to understand this definition because only products that satisfy all three limbs of this requirement are rescheduled to Schedule 2 and therefore then deemed lawful. Uh, the, requirement, the requirement for the product to be both produced for medicinal use and to be an ingredient in a medicinal product ensures that only products regulated as medicines and produced specifically for medicinal purposes are placed into Schedule 2. So, for example, any cannabis-based substance falling outside of this definition, um, a cannabis-based product that is classified as a medicine but is produced for recreational use, um, will remain a Schedule 1 drug to the 2001 regulations. So, whilst the law makes clear the definition of cannabis-based medicinal products uh, that can be prescribed, in essence, cannabis finds itself um, on both the Schedule 1 and the Schedule 2 list. And it's no wonder that the law is, as you say, uh, confusing for patients and even the police as well. So I, I know that was a, a heavy answer I gave there, but just, just to round off the answer, I, I just thought I'd give some, um, some examples where even, like I said, authorized users of medical cannabis may be in breach of the law. So um, you may still be in breach of the law um, if you possess unlawfully. That may be that you have no prescription that may also be that you have an invalid prescription. Um, it may also be under that umbrella that you possess more than has been prescribed um, to you. Um, separately, the supply of medical cannabis to a third party, obviously gifting or selling it to someone who may not be authorized um, it would be unlawful for, for one to do so. And then lastly, medical cannabis that is consumed via smoking. Um, the regulations of 2018 explicitly prohibit this. Um, so I think that probably answers the question. I'm, was, just, I'm sorry. To no, 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 brilliant. Very comprehensive and, and really useful to set out the law, and I think you did it in a really good way. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we'll talk about some of the practical steps to advise patients in a bit, but um, Jason, maybe you, you can talk about from your perspective of LEAP, what are some of the practical ways that these are, are playing out in, in, in practice and um, what are some of the most common issues that, that patients are suffering from? So to, to explain what we do in LEAP, um, we're an organisation of former and serving, but we can't mention too much about the serving because of uh, various different rules around political lobbying, but we are influenced and we have got serving members. But we're police officers, so I'm not myself, um, but we've got chief constables, undercover officers, MI5, um, people serving on magistrates. Um, we've got the whole spectrum of law enforcement. We've historically been campaigning for drug law reform of, of everything, so decriminalisation and very various different regulatory models of all drugs. To start with, because of my situation, because I was heading up the organisation, we obviously had quite a lot of input and influence and advocacy around medicinal cannabis. But then within the campaign frames when they were being proposed in 2016 and then later on in 2018 when the legislation started getting pushed through, we, we ended up backing away a little bit because we just weren't really needed because everybody else was taking care of it and doing a good job and making the progress that was needed. But over the last, I'd say, two years, we've definitely been called back into action on this specific subject. There's been a lot more... Uh, anecdotal reports uh, of patients that are still getting busted, that are still having even house raids. You know, there's big red keys still getting done with bathroom rams. Um, there's, I think, I think there's 
probably four identifiable points that we can make of why we're getting back more into this space. And one of them is the police. The bobbies on the beat don't know what they're doing. There's, it's, I think Sapphire, the clinic, have got it on their website that a third of all police officers have no idea this even exists. So that's how much is in the dark still. So how are police officers supposed to make rational choices when they don't even know? So somewhere along the line, the information isn't getting fed in. So that's one identification. The other one is stigma. There's still a lot of stigma around landlords, neighbours. So you've got this secondary raft of harms, not just because of the criminal justice system, but you could lose your housing, you could lose uh, friends even. You know, it's just simple things like that. So the stigma still very much exists because of what the laws are doing. There's another aspect, um, it may have been addressed today, but I think it's in the early stages of getting addressed. And it's, again, mainly anecdotal at the moment, and it's exploitation. There's a lot of gangs that have cotton onto this, that they know a legal system exists, that it comes via courier, and there's a lot of exploitation and robberies and things like that are going on. And I don't know how we're going to address that right this moment, because it is very concerning, especially for the patients that are already vulnerable. And again, it largely exists anecdotally at the moment, and I'd love for there to be more publicity around it, because I know of two cases personally, they're not willing to go ahead with publicity just yet. Um, but there might be more people that are connected to those cases. And also, the fourth point, I think, is the two-tier uh, system. So if you've got mental health notes, and I have know people, again, that have been massive advocates for getting this push forward, that have been doing this for decades, but they're still excluded from the medical system because of mental health notes. And that, I've got survivor's guilt on that because of uh, being a, a patient myself. I just don't, I can't have a system where we're still leaving people behind that have fought for this so hardly. And when the... 2018 legislation came through and the 2016 campaigns were starting to be formed. I was a little bit critical. I believed that we were getting somewhere with the full conversation around cannabis and that isolating it down to medical can sometimes have detracting factors, especially with regards to what we just said about within the police. The police don't know what they're doing. You've got one vaporizer there which is illegal cannabis and one vaporizer there which is legal cannabis. How are they going to make a discretionary arrest? It just is still a lot of bonkers legislation when you look at it in the round. I was quite critical of, of the, the movement of getting the way the approach was. And I almost think, and I still almost think, that we needed the segregation of almost paediatrics and adult use as opposed to medical and recreational use. The frames are interchangeable and we can, we can paint as many different um, marketing frames as we want, but that was always on my mind. And the concerns I had back then have definitely come to the forefront now. The fact we are getting these testimonies from patients saying that we are vulnerable for both from gangs, the police, confiscations. And of course, you've got to remember, if you have got a prescription and you're reliant on that prescription and it gets confiscated, the detriment that that can do to your health is just you can't actually put it into words. You know, this is, this is a tangible experience for those people that are going through that. And that's why we need to educate the police. And that's what we're trying to do more of now. And some of the conversations we're having within the police we can't make public yet because it's obviously discretional. But we are doing a lot more now on educating both off the record, but we're trying to get more and more on the record now. There's a coalition of us that are having some conversations. And that's what we need to do now is make aware of how big this picture is, why the current laws are so muddy, why there's stigma, and why the police need to be getting more involved in this in a positive way. Thank you. Um, I mean, each one of those aspects could be a talk in itself, I think. And um, what's really great is that you're, you know, you're all involved with the police to begin with, so you can, you know, at least have a bit more credibility when engaging with them, and hopefully that helps. Um, so thank you. Um, I think a prevailing theme amongst all of the panels has been around education and awareness. So, Elizabeth, it would be great. To, it, it, obviously, it's important, but you know. Where, where do you see that fitting in, and how are the CIC trying to kind of help that? Yeah, so education is crucial. Um, my experience in Australia you know, prior to moving three years ago to the UK uh, was sort of at the forefront of that education and change, and, and that really has led to you know, a million scripts in Australia, uh, much bigger uptake, magistrates refusing to prosecute, driving, uh, prosecutions when the person has a prescription now. So there are magistrates saying, I'm, I'm, I'm dismissing this case. Um, we're a big distance from that in the UK where magistrates feel that they must, even if they don't agree with it, they feel they are obligated and they must. Um, and so within the CIC, uh, what's been really wonderful to see the industry itself and people who 
uh, are other patient groups that are members. Uh, many people within the, um, the industry are also patients. So many people who, you know, founded companies or uh, work for companies are also patients. So there's a, you know, there's a constant discussion around the rights of patients. And within standards, which I've, I've chaired since the inception of, of the CIC, um, we made a decision to kind of do a hit list of issues and include not just the, the standards of the making of the medicine and the standards of the regulatory, but actually the standards that impact patients, which is not just is the medicine good quality, but are, how are their rights? Are police applying the, the right standards when they're dealing with patients? Uh, we, look, we do gap analysis, so is there a gap in the law? Is the law being misunderstood by police? Is it being misapplied? Is it being applied in a discriminatory way? And, and what we see is that it's a postcode lottery again, very much like even a, a licensed medicinal cannabis product. Getting access to that in the UK is a postcode lottery. You don't have equal access to those products that are licensed. You don't have equal access to um, cannabis-based uh, products for medicinal use in the UK because you need to have enough money, you need to live in the right postcode to even know that you can get access. And then you have to, you have to get your, your care record, right? And a lot of people, that's, they're too unwell to do all of that. I'm a carer, my husband is a medicinal cannabis patient, so I do that for my husband. It is burdensome. And then they come back to you and they want you to fill in the gaps the doctor didn't put in the record and I'm not the physician and I've got to chase the doctors. And, and you know, as we had in the previous Q&A, the burden on patients. No other condition gives you, or, or medical prescribing route places this burden on patients. So one of the things that we decided to do within CIC standards is to allow our members to nominate topics that would become projects within CIC. And um, this year we've had a very big focus on policing and driving and also on your rights at work. Uh, and we've produced um, a, a number of documents. We have a rigorous system whereby we develop the papers, we have a lot of consultation with all the stakeholders within and outside of the CIC. It, the paper then gets read multiple times, so it's a peer review process. It goes up to the executive committee. The executive committee will review it, maybe make some recommendations. Our own co-chair, Kelly Seaman, with her you know, academic experience, has now said we need to be using specific times of referencing so that these articles can eventually end up in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, and then once it's gone through this rigorous process, which takes many months after the document has been written, we then publish it as, we can accept it as policy, if that is the, the, the vote, and then it's published. From that, we can have further action items. So, for instance, the paper on driving, we've had two, aside from the paper which is published on the CIC website, we've created two tools. Uh, the small one is entitled Prescribed Cannabis Medicines and Driving, Guidance for Patients. A nice small leaflet that you can have with you so that you can understand your rights and understand what to do in order to make it unambiguous if you are confronted by a stop and search or you're pulled over while driving. And the second bigger document is Prescribed Cannabis Medicines, Possession Use and Driving, Guidance for Police. So a we big, liaise a bigger with document. a big document, uh, because what we found, and, and Guy Coxall and Francis Cruisden uh, were really instrumental in the writing of this paper. Uh, each of the projects will have champions who lead these projects, and then my job is to just keep them on track and make sure people can, can get access to the right resources. So they've produced a fantastic set of documents. You can access these documents, go to CEDAR Futures stand here, and see Guy. Um, he has a limited number printed, but he can give you the QR code to access it from the website and download it. It's completely free. Uh, and um, the other paper that was written that has been led by Guy Coxall as well and Mohammed Waswe, some of you might know Mohammed as Ish, um, and that's the use of prescription cannabis at work. And this is another area where people are really discriminated against and don't know their rights uh, and, uh, and can sometimes lose their job or feel very afraid to tell their 
you know, their employer that, that they're a medicinal cannabis patient. And this is a, a really important paper. And there's a third paper that is being developed, which is a really around more the housing and within the law uh, around, you know, uh, eviction, uh, complaints by neighbours, but also around custody and if you are uh, under the care of, of social security. So these are really important subjects. That paper will come out very, very shortly. Um, in a little while, the use of, of prescription cannabis at work is imminent in a published form and will be uh, up on the website. So you don't have to be a CIC member to access these, so please feel free to use these resources. Um, and you know, feel free to give them to others. <laughs> <laughs> Let's educate as far as we possibly can. Yeah, thank you so much, and that's brilliant work that you're doing, and I think it really highlights just how many battles that need to be fought on, on many levels. Um, Tom, let's bring you in now. Um, maybe you can give us a business perspective on this, and do you think industry could be doing more? Obviously, it's not in the business interest for your customers to be getting arrested for buying a product. So, yeah, what do you think of that in general? Well, look, business perspective, I suppose... I can only give my perspective, but then I can move on to say what I, I see in the rest of the industry. But look, let's just start this. It's shocking what is going on today. We've got medicinal patients that are being treated unfairly. And look, the deep dive we have gone on now with Canda for the last year has all been about addressing what are the pain points for patients? How are patients being treated? How can we make patients' lives better? And through that process, where I've been intrinsic in the development of this app, I have been absolutely shocked. Why are patients that should be able to take their medication being restricted from doing so? And look, we have these clear cases, like with the police, which are absolutely wrong. But for me, it's even the smaller things. When we go to a hotel, when we're taking, doing some travel, when we're doing anything that any normal person should do, we should be able to use our medicines. We wouldn't restrict people from using inhalers for asthma. Why are patients being refused? So look, for me, my perspective is it's shocking. Looking at other business, now look, we, we have a scope of businesses in the sector. We have organisations that are, are, are funded with very small funding that, that don't really look after profits, that are looking after patients, so like, like organisations like the CIC and other trade bodies or, or community groups. We've got the other end of the spectrum where we've got high investment companies that are only looking for profits. So, again, my perspective here is where do, I, where do we come in um, for, for candor and what I believe in improving the rights of, of patients? We wanted to ensure that we addressed all of, all of these pain points. You can't get away from the fact that, that businesses need to make money. You can't get away from the fact that you've got community groups which don't have the financial power to do so. But look, we've been in this sector for eight years. Everything that's driven me personally with British Cannabis for the last eight years has been about improving the lives of people. When I started this journey with Canda, I wasn't aware of the certain aspects of what we were going to deliver. But what I believe that we've now got is a situation where we can drive change. Because look, for me, I'm in business, I'm a businessman. I look for solutions to problems. Obviously, we need to maintain a profitable company to be able to enact those solutions, but it's, it's really important to do that. Um, and, and looking at this, look, I, I think there's some amazing work being done by people in the industry, going back to the start of the CBD sector, where I was very heavily involved with MHRA when they tried to shut it down, involved in Europe, involved with setting up the CTA at the time. Again, that, that's great that we can do that, but look, business can do more. We can change things with solutions within business, and that's exactly what we've tried to do with Canda. Now, we've got the Canda card, which I won't go into detail about, but it's got, got all your details on, like your prescription. So it gives you that first level of protection if you face issues with police, with security staff, with hotel establishments. Now, if you face any issues with those establishments, if they're breaching your rights, and part of the app is educating you guys if your rights are being breached, there's the option there to then report that incident. Now, for me, we can lobby, we can push, we can form these groups, but I can't guarantee how long that process will take. I've been involved in these processes before. I know by providing a solution like this incident report in, we can push through reported incidents of patient rights being breached. And if we cause a problem for the police, and I think the police is the biggest issue that we need to address, but this goes across the sector, if we push enough complaints to them, there's a problem that they have to sort out. 
that then results in the change that we want to see. And this is where I really believe, and this is at what the core of Candor is. Look, Candor is a solution that I've brought to the market now and has been launched today, which I believe is the solution. But it's imperative now that we need you, the patient, to get involved with Candor, to bring your value in. Because this change ultimately is going to benefit the patient at the end of the day. The more reports that we get of this unlawful behaviour of patient rights being breached, um, and all of these scenarios that we see, the more reports we get, the more reports we push through, the quicker we will get change. So that's the way I see it. I mean, what can other businesses do? They can look at similar things to us. But I think as an industry as a whole, and from someone that's been in this industry, in the CBD side and now in the medicinal sector for eight years, what has always worked in those eight years is working together. Now, everyone's got their commercial interests, but we've seen over those eight years, there's a certain set group of people within this industry that work together for a shared goal. That shared goal goes right back to the very pinnacle of what business is. If we address these legal rights issues with patients, we'll get more patients into the system. That's gonna benefit business. That's gonna benefit more patients coming into the system and protecting the health, really, of the nation with cannabis and what we're doing. Yeah, and th thank you for that, Tom. Yeah, I think it sums up very well. We've talked about stigma a lot, and you know, if these issues, uh, yeah, if you have to worry about arrest and just the hassle of it, all of this stuff, it's going to keep cannabis naive patients from even, you know, uh, interacting with this world. So that does make complete sense. Um, maybe we could talk a bit about the practical steps, and Jason, maybe you, you can help here. I, Oh, but equally, if anyone else, um, please pipe, pipe up. Um, what are some of the practical steps that people can, can use if they are legitimately possessing medical cannabis as per Richard's sort of de definition earlier, but they still run into trouble? What can they do practically? It's, it's a really difficult one to answer because ultimately there should be no issue. So you're de dealing with the discretion of the people that you're dealing with and the officers at that point. So if there are being a reasonable uh, and you can have a conversation, you should have all the mitigation you need. Failing that and you are getting confiscated, then you do have to take it further. You can potentially, one of the routes you could go is with the PCCs because they're there to set the mandate of what the route, and this goes into the postcode lottery that we were just speaking about. If you've got a PCC that is generally quite on board with the broad themes, um, you might actually get somewhere in the, complaints commission, in the complaints process also then influencing what they do to their remits and their goals to the, to the foot soldiers of the police. Um, and one of the things that we also have to address is in, within the postcode lottery is race. Again, we're still seeing within this sector, just as we're seeing in the broad cannabis sector, that you, if you are from a Bain background, you are getting more hassled still. It's, it's still prevalent. So we shouldn't be having any issues. And to have to influence is a really big, tricky question to ask. And again, where do we, where do we have the influence? Do we go to Parliament? And again, Parliament should know this. We shouldn't be having any influence there. It should be sorted. I, I do believe that the PCC route could be quite a good, decent route to, ch to chase, along with you know, going to chief constables. Um, the other issue with this, with the PCCs and the postcode lottery that we keep referring to, is we've just had a coalition of PCCs that was kind of backed by the Home Secretary to make cannabis a Class A drug. And this is where it then dovetails back into the stigma and what it does to the... To the um, the culture of policing. This, we say the word culture of policing a lot, and, and you, especially within the Met, and probably everybody in this room knows of the issues with the Met. Um, and this is what we need to influence, is that all the while we don't have the appropriate tools that we should, and this is where there's going to be a lot of off-the-record stuff that we're going to be doing, as well as on-the-record training that we're going to be trying to put out there, there is no easy answer. We, we should have the easy answers, and they don't currently exist. That is the question. Why don't they exist? A big question. <laughs> um, so th thank you. Uh, uh, that's the route that we were talking about. But we, as Elizabeth was talking about, there's lots of battles that everyone needs to have. And maybe if you're on the wrong end of one of these sort of interactions with the police, maybe you just don't have the energy to, to fight that. Are there organisations that can help advocate on behalf of people? Yeah, so, so uh, Seed Our Future do a lot of work. Uh, I know CanCard also do a lot of work in this area. This was recently really brought home to me in a very personal way in that my 
Uh, my husband and I were out meeting friends for dinner. My husband's a, a medical cannabis patient. He normally only takes cannabis right before he goes to bed, but because it was going to be a late night and in a diff different situation, he has complex PTSD, he thought if he gets anxious, he'd just take a little bit that he could use. He hadn't ingested it yet, but he had it on his person. Uh, and it was way below the threshold <laughs> for criminal conduct. And um, on the way home, he noticed that we were being followed by a police car. He's a slow driver at the best of times. We were in the country, country roads. He was slowing down as we were going into a 30 zone. He was, you know, made the speed limit, all of that. Sirens came on, we got pulled over and he said, someone has dobbed us in. That was, that was his words. And I said, oh, don't be silly. Like, they've just pulled us over for some reason. And they came to the window and they said, sir, we don't see that you're insured to drive this car. We can only see a woman is insured to drive this car and I carry our insurance papers in the car, and I pulled out the folder and I said, my husband is the primary insured person for this vehicle. I literally checked it yesterday. I'm the secondary person. Check it for yourself. And they pushed it away. And they said, sir, we have reason to believe you have cannabis on your person, and you are driving under the influence of cannabis. My heart fell through the floor. I knew what was coming. So... We got out of the vehicle. We're in, we live in a small country town. This is the country town next to ours. Everyone that went past this main street saw what was happening. They took him out of the vehicle. They searched me. They searched him. They searched the vehicle. They found the very small amount of cannabis. He'd explained he was a patient. I had tried to explain the rights. They told me to be quiet. Um, they then he explained his condition that he had a right to have the product on him, that he hadn't ingested it yet, that it had been, in, you know, he hadn't had cannabis for 24 hours. They called the drug detection team. We had to sit there for half an hour with everyone going past us, seeing what was happening. He was tested in plain sight of everyone. They said, we'll wait eight minutes for this test to show positive. It didn't show positive for 30 minutes and it barely showed positive and they were over it like this. They then, then they then uh, arrested him, handcuffed him, took him back to the main station. Uh, they told me where I could wait for him, that I couldn't come into the station. I then said, my husband has very serious chronic PTSD. They strip searched him, they cavity searched him, they humiliated him. They then said, we see you have complex PTSD. Are you at risk of self-harm? He said, that's why I take medicinal cannabis, because every day I am at risk of self-harm after being sexually assaulted as a child. And they just assaulted him. He was suicidal for the next month. That's why I do what I do. Yeah. This is unbelievable. And then he got a letter saying, oh, <laughs> you, you had under the threshold for possession. Um, you have to wait a year for the test to come back. If we pull you over again and you have cannabis in your system, it, you will proceed to a more serious charge and you will have immediate loss of license. So he has to wait a year. Oh. It's just... So it's not just, and he lost his, you know, basically we had to surrender his, his cannabis at home. We were threatened with a house search. Then we were followed. Every time we were in our van, we'd see police vehicles circle around and come and follow us when we were driving. And then we found out that there was a major drug bust in that area. When my husband was in the police station after they had stripped and cavity searched him, they said, we can't find your criminal record. He said, I don't have one. But people like you, I'm sorry, he said, what do you mean by people like me? He said, drug users. He said, I'm a medicinal cannabis patient. I hold down a steady job. I don't use cannabis when I'm offshore. I only use it when I'm onshore. And he, he said, you know, have you got your, your cam on? And they said, oh, no, we haven't got them on us. He said, I want you to record the conversation. We think that they thought he was a major drug criminal and that we were like some criminal masterminds <laughs> distributing cannabis. So these, 
preconceptions because a, a week or so later, a massive bust happened in the area we'd had dinner. <laughs> and an older person got charged with, you know, being an importer of, of, of illicit drugs and you know, being the head of a, a, a drug gang. But this is what you're facing. It's not just the seizing of your product and then you have to go and pay to get it again and you have to wait and you're unwell. But you've been re-traumatised. Mm. How is that acceptable? It's, 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 I, I mean, I was literally, with everything I know, I was powerless to stop it. I was so frustrated, so angry and so sad. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. I think oh, everyone's my husband that went blood is it. boiling in this room at yeah. the moment, hearing that story, um, and just so frustrating and so traumatic. And thank you for sharing. I hope he's I hope he's doing better now. Yeah, um, he is. Um, I mean, just highlights, doesn't it, how just sort of slightly petty and vindictive they can be. Yeah. Um, and maybe there's some other context that we're not aware of, but that that's just a totally infuriating situation. They they couldn't believe that he wasn't like a lifelong criminal, that he didn't have a criminal record. This, was, this is the stigma, these are the assumptions, that even if you're a medicinal patient, that somehow you're a criminal who's trying, found this other way to get your stuff. That's quite profound oh. ignorance there, isn't there? That's, that's really scary. Um, thank you. Um, I think we're gonna try and get a few questions from the audience now, if anyone has one. Hi, I'm um, a patient, but also an appropriate adult. So I've got quite a unique position in that I have to take my medical cannabis into the police station to look after juveniles who might be have, have been arrested for possession. And I'd love to perhaps speak about how I could bring things with me and make sure that solicitors are aware as well of all the documents you're producing. So thank you. Thank and you. just anything um, any advice you could give now of anything that I could use in those positions? So, so the person who's a real expert on this is Guy Coxall, who is in where the stands are. Um, he does an am amazing job, um, and he's a person that I refer to you know, because he, he his life is fighting for patients that are in these sorts of situations. The, the damage to people's human rights uh, that occurs in this, so this is a massive human rights issue. It, it's, it's across all drug and drug reform, but cannabis patients at the moment are, are really being hit with it, and we're seeing increased action, and I think some of that is around, you know, the um, Suella Braverman's saying that police need need to apply the law, don't use your discretion, right? Um, and, and, and kind of saying that somehow they're going easy on people with small amounts of cannabis or, or, or medicinal cannabis or whatever. So I would go see someone like Guy who can refer you to other people, um, the right uh, solicitors, uh, the right advice, and help you to understand the approach to put a complaint in, which is our next step. Uh, and you know, this is what he does, so I, I would definitely go talk to him. He has copies of all the documents that have been produced. The irony was we were working on these documents before this happened to my husband, and it was like, ah. Uh. But um, yes, and I think we need to make those resources, those legal experts who are willing to work in this field and provide advice, we need to know who they are uh, and, and we need to know how to access them. And again, most people who are patients don't have the money <laughs> to go through an expensive legal system. So how can we find a way to support patients so that it's not an additional financial burden mm. along with, oh, I can't drive now, I'm gonna lose my job, all of those other things that happen with, with this kind of persecution. Yeah, absolutely. Tom. Yeah, yeah, can I just reaffirm that position, I suppose? Um, again, Guy is like a guardian angel for patients in this industry, working for free. I mean, all the discussions we've had, I've known Guy for a long time. Um, any patients that are facing issues, he's there and supporting and can take you along that journey. But look, for me, it's all about in these situations, what patients can do. We can't just rely upon businesses or organisations. What patients can do. So you can carry around documents like this. We're already looking to try and digitise some of this and bring it into some applications like our, our own and share that with other people. Obviously, utilising Guy. But 
I think fundamental to this is where we do see change and where patients can really be the drive of that change. It's unfortunate that patients are the ones that are going to have to educate um, authorities, businesses, but if that's how we have to see change happen, that's what we'll do. And with the remarkable work of the CIC and people like Guy in supporting the patients, there's a vast amount of the industry here to help you. So reach out, get these documents, and uh, yeah, I think we can see some significant change in, in the future over the next few years. Um, now we're all working together. Yes, fingers crossed, thank you. Uh, Jason. I'd, I'd definitely like to give a shout out to Release, because Release are absolutely second to none. Uh, drug Science works with them, and there's a card there that you can pick up out there that I've got. Release are absolutely superb for legal advice. They're non-judgmental any legal advice for any drugs, but especially for this department as well. And just to quickly uh, go into what you said about the, the weird interactions you had with the police, not just what they did, but the weird interactions. And it's, it's because of the culture of policing. We're target driven. Pol crime isn't there to be uh, solved or managed anymore. It's a target driven service. So if you get your arrest rate up, you get more chances of promotion. So this is why they go for what we often refer to, it might be, uh, derogatory to say, but the low hanging fruits. So if you do, if there is a detection of odour of cannabis, that's enough for a stop and search or a general search or even a strip search, which we've seen with, even with children. So that's why we need a complete cultural shift. We, we're not going to get away from small incremental steps. If we are going to address all of these different things that we've been saying about is the cultural change. Yeah, and I think we saw the well reported case of the two athletes that were yes. stopped and searched and exactly. I think two Officers were sacked as a consequence. Um, so yeah, it's, it's affecting lots and lots of people um, in different ways. Um, do we have another question? Before we move to our next question, I want to just reiterate that these purple postcards, which are all in your tote bags today, are, um, and contain a QR code for a free download to our Know Your Rights on Medical Cannabis uh, free digital download, digital document. And this has been produced by Drug Science in collaboration with Release and with Employment and Discrimination Lawyers at Macro Solicitors as well. So in addition to the fantastic CIC uh, materials which have been produced by Guy Coxall and the Cannabis Industry Council, please do make sure you've got a postcard and uh, just scan the QR code in order to access that document. And we're going to do our utmost to keep that information up to date as these things are always evolving. Thank you, Max. Hi, I'm Franco Ferreira from ECS Pharma. Um, I just want to <laughs> express my feeling for Elizabeth and that story and for many people in this industry who've gone through that. Um, together with Francis Crutzen, I've been helping on their background to help Guy write this document that was uh, released today uh, and including, sadly, an attempt to try and, and help Guy find legal people in the legal industry who prepare to take up the cases for some of these, these patients uh, there is an absolute desert of uh, criminal lawyers who want to continue to work in the criminal justice system. I think that that whole sector is under enormous stress. Uh, but secondly, for them to take up the case in this industry is non-existent. Uh, we've gone through legal aid uh, uh, officers and their legal aid departments for people around the country who look after fishing, uh, trawling families, etc., etc., and you get to cannabis and everything goes dead. There is a guy, as he's mentioned before, he works incredibly hard. I'm pleased he's not here, um, but he's, he gets paid nothing for it, and increasingly people are calling him because the only one with real knowledge, and he is, he is completely washed out through all the efforts that he's put into it. We need people like him, and we need him to train other legal advisors, and we need a network of legal uh, uh, firms who can be at the end of a call center line, where as an industry, if somebody has a similar situation that Elizabeth had, notwithstanding her knowledge 
of how to defend herself, you can say to the police, I want to call someone in this call center. And my call is that as a manufacturer, I would like to propose that part of our revenue goes towards paying towards a legal aid scheme uh, and similarly patients could click on the button potentially when they buy their product to say I want to make a contribution towards a fund that would support a legal framework and people at the end of a call. So when you are in that situation, you can have somebody say, please, could you speak to the policeman? And you remove quite a lot of this tension and all of that emotion around the situation. And somebody on the other end of the line can call your clinic and ask for your prescription, etc., etc. But to remove that whole toxic environment at the scene, at the arrest, is something I think is an important first step. But we need a funding mechanism. And I think everybody, producers, patients, everybody on a kind of crowd-funded format, I think is one of the, the options for us to look at. Because in the absence of that, we just have disastrous personal experiences. So if anybody wants to sort of corner me at the end of this, we can try and find a route. Thank you. Can I, can I just, um, Francois, um, you know, I want to thank you for the work that you do behind the scenes within the CIC and the support you give to a lot of the papers of being kind of like the common sense check very often uh, and, and also the connection that you've made for a lot of the project leaders with resources, um, legal resources and other expert resources. The thing that was particularly scary, which I didn't mention before, was I wanted to start on the whole my husband's rights, all of this. And they said, we know who you are. We have checked you out thoroughly. And my husband looked at me and he said, huh? And so we were left with this just weird feeling of, did they think because I'm in the cannabis industry that I was a drug queen? <laughs> I don't know what was going on. But it was so bizarre. Yeah. It was such a bizarre situation. and and. I found it really disempowering. Yes. Incredibly disempowering, let alone what my husband went through. And, and I can imagine what other people, and we, we know it's happening. We know it's not just my husband. This is happening to people all over the country. Yeah. And it's inconceivable that this can be happening in 2023. Absolutely. Um, yeah, all kind of like snooping kind of elements there. Very scary. Uh, Ashwin. Cool. We, um, we've got a couple uh, Zoom questions. I've got a question for myself for um, the CIC. Um, has the CIC done any uh, outreach work with uh, the trade union movement to respond to the last gentleman's uh, line? Um, trade unions such as the GMB um, and others uh, provide funding for uh, legal uh, cases to do with employment law. However, employment law and uh, cannabis law and prohibition as well as the education movement, can all wrap up within a link with the trade union body. So I was interested with, especially your driving and GMB's representation of truck drivers, is there any outreach work going? So, so there definitely was outreach, especially for the um, Your Rights at Work paper, which is about to be published. And um, I'm not sure if, if um, Mohamed Waswe or Guy are in the room because they would be able to directly comment um, because I, I was kind of overseeing things, but I wasn't directly in the conversations. And they really struggled to get any response from any union um, on this matter. Uh, that's my recollection, and, and, and please, if, if either of them are in the room, can correct, correct me. That's right? Okay, perfect. Um, so, so, again, we need mechanisms for people, a mechanism of introduction that could be get us to the right decision makers because obviously most of us will only reach people on a lower rung of the tree <laughs> and those people only usually have the power to say no. <laughs> so we need introductions to people who are decision makers within unions, um, uh, people's rights at work. Uh, uh, the picture is very different to what most would assume. We assume that, uh, you know, as a cannabis patient, you you could lose your job, you can't use product at work, but actually the law is completely different to that. Um, and so I, when that paper comes out, I really encourage you to download it and read it, because I found it very eye-opening. But we need to find ways to get into the unions and make this an issue that they're interested in. I think they just think it's 
a small issue and not worth their time and they've got bigger things on their plate. I also find that our struggle, both in Australia and, and in the UK, has been that political parties don't want to touch the, any of this. And so the, the parties that have power go silent. You have low, you know, low on the rungs of power politicians who are really strong advocates, but they have no power to make a difference. And so you hear these bills read out in Parliament and the Parliament's empty, and I find that disgusting. Everyone vacates, no one wants, wants to be there when a, a bill, you know, or a, a question time about medicinal cannabis comes up. They will like scatter like cockroaches. Um, so we have to hold our local members to account. Yes, we have letter writing campaigns, but I think we have to find a way to do more and we have to find a way to make it an issue in the next election. Absolutely. I mean, it speaks to the general conservatism in this country, exemplified by our 1950s Home Secretary, who replaced the last 1950s Home Secretary, um, in relation to drugs, but it also extends to all public bodies. Yeah. Um, trade unions, I'm not surprised by. Everyone's just scared of it, really. Um, I think we've got to to wrap up now. So thank you for all the questions and thank you to our panel. Uh, please put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you.